Well, welcome if you're in Townsville or in Upland, you're joining us now too. And this is a little bit tied around Fontana, but this is important for all of you who are just joining us or just stepping into our community. And there are a lot of you that have been doing that over the last few weeks and last few months. And we wanted to say, first of all, we're glad that you're here, but I want to tell you a little bit of a story before we get started in the sermon this morning. About nine years ago, a man and I um, walked down an aisle at this church. It wasn't pretty. And we were in that gym over there. It was like, you know, gym floor. It was not romantic visually, but it was romantic to me because I got to marry her. It was great. Uh, but, and that's not why I'm sharing this with you, but what, what we didn't know is what we were walking into, what we would need in that journey. And I'm not sure we still do, but we're still in the process of figuring that out. And what we didn't realize is just two weeks after our wedding, we went to a gathering of people who invited us, people that are now very much a part of our journey. In fact, our kids even call them aunt and uncle. But what we didn't realize is going to that gathering Somebody had put it together and called it a frol frolic, and I was a little suspicious of the name, but I went anyway, and I'm glad I did, because from that group, from that gathering, we've been in a community group with people for the last nine years doing life together, the same group for nine years, and that is, we didn't, I don't think we understood how critical that would be to our journey how much they pour into and speak into our spiritual life, our healing, our growth, our accountability, and help us journey farther with Jesus. And so when you walked in today, if you're here on campus, you were given one of these. And you're given one of these because this is a way for you to get connected, to care for your marriage, care for your relationship, and to continue to grow and find connection and community here. It's easy to walk into a room like this and learn, but one of the ways that we know we have to grow is with other people in our journey that know us, that walk with us, that are part of our story. And so we wanna encourage you to do that. Over the next several weeks, we're gonna bring some places for you to get connected in front of you, keep them in front of you. There are lots of ways to do that online and get connected with even just here in a connection corner or here in the guest services area. We can get you connected, but we wanna make sure you understand this, how important it is for you to do that for your own journey and for your kids and for your families and for your legacy. Sound good? good. So if you are visiting um, or if you're like me and you're big, uh, a bit forgetful. See, aren't you glad you don't have to speak for a living? Uh, we'll give you a little recap. So if you are visiting, I know a lot of you are here visiting because your family promised you lunch afterwards if you came to the kids' baby dedication. But what we'd like you to do is kind of kind of go on his journey with us. So we're in telling the story of Joseph and trying to mirror our lives and understand our lives through the lens of the life of Joseph and the lessons that God has for us. And so if you don't know the story of Joseph, it's found in Genesis, which is really the first Hebrew scripture and takes up quite almost the entire end of, of uh, Genesis. And one of the things that happens in Genesis is really important is that Joseph shows up and his journey is a really interesting one. So Joseph was the favorite son I know none of you have favorite children because it's illegal, it's against the law, but you all have one anyway. And Joseph was the favorite child and his dad made it known that he was the favorite child. And he had a bunch of brothers, like almost 12 of them. And you could imagine how the other brothers felt about him. It was like, you can go now. So they helped him on his way. And if you know the story of Joseph, they, uh, plot to kill him, one of the brothers talks them out of it, and then they end up selling him to slave traders that are going to Egypt. Not only did they sell him to slave traders, they took his coat, by the way, his dad gave him a really special coat to signify how special he was. So you know that that was gonna play a part in the story, right? They put blood on it and pretend that it's actually shredded and they tell their dad, oh, your favorite son got killed by animals. Meanwhile, they sold him off into slavery. They lied to dad. They sold their brother. And then you can imagine being Joseph, this young kid who's a, probably a teenager at the time, who's grown up in a nomadic community, living in the, in the, what we would call the Canaanite desert, walking from well to well with nomadic people living in tents and small towns. He gets chained up, hiked across the desert to Egypt to the world power, world superpower of the day, walks into this country, not speaking a language that he could understand, not knowing how to communicate, probably met Egyptians, but had never been there before, walks into this country, walking in, and by the way, at this point, the pyramids of Giza have already been built, so you can imagine this kid who lives as a nomad in the desert, walking into a country that was mighty, it was powerful, had chariots and horses and infrastructure and a pyramid that is gigantic. Now, you can imagine what it'd be like to walk in, or maybe you can't, 
maybe I can't either because we've watched so many things be built, but recognizing that Joseph didn't even understand that humans could build things like that. And you could understand the overwhelming sense of anxiety. I mean, we always think like anxiety is like a new thing. Like we just discovered it in the last like, like five years. Since certain generations came of age, we just discovered it. Like, you know, look at us, we found anxiety. Let me just say, there are lots of generations before us that have experienced anxiety. And I'll tell you, this guy experienced it. And what happened in his journey is his anxiety, he had a choice. He had a choice to trust or he had a choice to give in to the temptation to be discouraged and dismayed. And the thing that's so important about Joseph's story is that Joseph had a promise. Joseph's promise was simple, it was this. God is with, all right, we'll try this one more time. Uh, God is with, with you. That's the story of scripture from the beginning to the end is that God is with you. And more than that, God wants to be with you. So Joseph ends up, and this is kind of the backstory, and I'll give you the rest of it here in a second, because the story is really meaty, and, and really, Joseph gets purchased as a slave by this guy named Potiphar. Potiphar is a pretty powerful guy in, in Egypt. He's basically the commander of the bodyguards of Pharaoh, and basically in charge of like his security. And Pharaoh is an important dude and reb rebellions and you know all kinds of things happen all over in these cultures and so he's got a pretty important job. So Joseph is actually put in the household of one of the more important people in the country. It says that quickly he became in charge of the, he the entire household. So you're taking this Hebrew kid who didn't know how to speak the language, quickly adapts, overcomes, uses his skills, uses his ability to lead, lead uses all these things that he has learned in his journey, puts them to use for his slave owner, serving and serving. And remember, Joseph's journey is full of injustice. And so this is the first question we asked the first week was, is it possible that in the middle of injustice, in the middle of suffering, that God might actually be at work? And we're in church, so we say yes. Like, of course it is. But inside we're like, forget that. But this is what Joseph's journey is outlined over and over and over. His story is riddled with injustice after injustice after injustice. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago and his life isn't fair, period. My life growing up in our house, that was called the F word. Because life isn't, you can do a little bit better. I know you don't want that to be true, but life isn't. Every time you look in the mirror, or at least I do, I'm reminded of that. Because then I come here and see all you people. I'm like, man, they gotta stare at me. But look, here's my point. And this is the part we have to settle in us. Is that God very well may actually be at work, and this is the first week, at work in the middle of injustice, even though it isn't part of what he would want for you. He will use it to do great work in you. And all the church people are like, yeah, pastor. <laughs> and all the visitors are like, these people are crazy. <laughs> they think bad things are good things. No, 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 we just believe this, that Jesus can take what is meant for evil and transform it into healing, redemptive work. There's all the church people again, but that's okay. <clears throat> Week two, we just said this, that, that Joseph had to make some decisions in the middle of, his, of this injustice. He's like, I have a choice. I can choose to thrive in the middle of this suffering or I can choose to let it swallow me. And then he's making a decision that we all have to make at some point in our journey, which is I got to choose to thrive where I'm planted, not be angry about where I am. This is rough. Like in just this, you're like, I don't deserve to be here. You might not, but you're there, <laughs> right? It's like, we can just pretend that we're not there if you want to, but you are. And the question is, what are you going to do while you're there? And Joseph over and over, you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't be like, oh, my life's so hard. Somebody feel bad for me. You know what he says is, I got a promise that God will be with me. It was a promise that was given to his great grandfather, it was given to his grandfather, it was given to his father, and it was given to him. Every one of them had a covenant before the Lord. And you know what he said? He's like, by the way, I don't even know, but I had this dream, and he told the dream to his brothers, which he shouldn't have done because it was just for him. But that dream gave him a picture of God doing something powerful with him, but he didn't give him the picture of what he was going to have to endure on the way to that place that he was going to have a major difference made for the entire world at the time 
based on the decisions he would make. He just had a picture. He had a promise that God would be with him and that he would use him to do great things. And here's, here's the catch. This is the hard part. And we talked about this over the last three weeks, four weeks. We said, hey, listen, character is the building block to all of this. You do not have a legacy and a journey on the other side of it because this is what ends up, right? We hear these stories, we hear these people, we see these people and their legacy that they leave, we use that word wrong sometimes, we just call people having legacies because they did something that we liked, not actually something meaningful. But when there's a legacy that has meaning, meaning this, it actually is a legacy, meaning it made the world a better place. That their journey, their family, their investment, they leveraged their gifts, skills, talents, and resources for the greater good. You know what never is absent in those spaces? Character. Character, and we said this a couple weeks ago, character, God-shaped character is the building block to succeeding in a journey of life. Without it, without it, we flounder and we pretend that we're succeeding, but we're not. We elude ourselves, we tell ourselves lies and we believe lies, illusions that things are actually going well for us, but the truth is, is we're just pretending. We're living an illusion. And what we said last week was this, is we talked about the prophetic word and the prophetic move of God, and we just said that part of prophecy is about speaking into the present and the future, but really a lot of prophecy is that God is speaking into the past to redeem the present for the future. And a lot of us have wrestled with this and need to wrestle with the reality that we have forfeited. Listen, we have forfeited our calling, or we might say around here, our destiny because we sold it short. We quit too soon. And this will be the part of our journey that we talk about today, that discouragement, disillusionment are often deterrents. And this is how we would see them. We would say, wow, that's probably not what God has for me because I'm discouraged and I'm disillusioned, so I'm gonna quit. What if those are not deterrents, but they are actually invitations to grow, to heal, to change, and let God do the great work that he wants to do? So let me pray for us really quick. If you'd open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 40, I'd love to pick up there. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the promise that you are with us. We thank you for the promise that you can take what was meant for evil and turn into something good, not just for us, but for the world around us. And you've always been in the business of doing things for the world around us and using the people that are in front of you who are surrendered and willing to do it. And I pray that we would listen and respond like Joseph did. Be willing to recognize that his story is great, but it is marked out by surrender and trust and a commitment to grow and change and let you be God in all of the circumstances. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. In Genesis, I'm actually gonna go backwards really quick and then chapter 40 is gonna come up on the screen. I wanna read verses 39, uh, chapter 39, the very last two verses because it sets up the whole thing for you, but I'll give you a little bit of the story before we do. So Joseph is in this house, Potiphar's house, and it says that Potiphar's wife found him very attractive. Just side note, I said this a couple weeks ago, it does not tell us if Joseph found Potiphar's wife attractive. We just know that she wanted Joseph. We always celebrate him like, oh, look, he ran away. Maybe she wasn't that good looking. It wasn't that hard. You don't know. It's a true story. That's not my commentary. I borrowed that from somebody, but it's true. But Joseph, um, she keeps coming out. He said, I can't dishonor God and I cannot dishonor your husband. You cannot, I would not do this. And she keeps coming on to him. And finally, one day she's alone with him and she comes on to him and he's like, oh no, this is bad. And he runs out and she grabs his outer cloak. She holds it. And then when she's shamed and embarrassed, she goes to her husband and everybody else and says, the Hebrew you brought in here, Joseph's trying to hurt me and tried to assault me and try to take advantage of me. So Potiphar was like, really? And then we had this whole conversation a couple weeks ago over here with us that <laughs> maybe he knew his wife a little too well because if he didn't, he probably would have just killed Joseph. But what we do know is that Joseph ends up in prison for another thing that he didn't do. And this is where we pick up. It says this in verse 22 and 23, the chief jailer, now he's in jail, committed to Joseph charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made prosper. Just a quick point. You know where we never get to say the Lord made him prosper or her prosper? 
in the middle of the thing. You only get to say that on the other side of it. So we're all sitting there going, how come God's not helping me bless me? Maybe he is, and it's gonna take years and generations before you actually get to see the fruit of what God was doing. Joseph didn't write this about himself. People wrote this hundreds of years later about him and about looking with the long lens of history at his journey. Don't miss this. We, we miss this stuff all the time. We think, well, how come it's not happening right now? Because we're the world that like clicks a button. I said this a couple weeks ago. And then a package shows up on your porch like four hours later, right? Like we're just used to that. And he's like, no, no, no. I'm into lasting whole change that changes the trajectory of families and histories and countries and people groups, not just moments. But here's what he goes on. It says this in verse chapter 40, verses one and two. I'm gonna read those and I'll have you read me three and four, but read with me three and four, but they'll be up on the screen. Then it came about after these things, the cupbearer and the baker, for the king of Egypt offended their Lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was furious with his two officials and the cupbearer and the chief baker were thrown in prison. And this, let's pick up in verse three. Can you guys read this with me? It says this. So he put them in confinement of the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the jail, the same place where Joseph was in prison. The captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them and he took care of them and they were in confinement for some time. I get this just for context. We don't know how long Joseph is in there, but it was probably a long time. We know it was at least more than two years. Two years for doing nothing. But Joseph has an opportunity or he has a choice, right? Joseph keeps getting promoted, but he has a decision to make. It doesn't feel like a promotion when you're in jail, does it? But look at the long lens of this, the backwards looking, us looking at this on this side of history, what we see is like, oh, look at, he could have just been a guy chained to a wall in the prison, but God promoted him. But the real question we should ask ourselves is why did he? Why did God position Joseph to do that? Here's my take, and we don't read this in scripture, but this is how I see it. I know this about Joseph's journey is that somewhere in his journey, he had to learn how to submit so that he could learn humility so that he could be a servant. And in this midst of him being a servant leader, what Joseph never missed was that he wasn't a slave. This is so important. He's owned property. Well, it's kind of a weird thing in the ancient world, but he was kind of owned property. It wasn't like chattel slavery like we have in the United States. This is a little bit different. But for all intents and purposes, he is responsible and someone owns him and can control his destiny. But he wasn't concerned about Potiphar or Pharaoh controlling his destiny. He didn't believe they could. You know what he believed? That God was with That's what he believed. So over and over, when he's given opportunity, he takes the opportunity to be faithful back towards God. I know my journey, I don't know about yours, but whenever I've been given authority to do things or power, you might say, we're all tested by it, right? I don't do very good with it. How about you? No show of hands, but do you remember the first time that you were given a power and authority over your own self? Like it just starts with you, right? I do. I was allowed to take my bike, my BMX bike, and I was allowed to ride it all the way down to the store on my own on a Saturday after I finished doing my chores and I had my allowance in my pocket for mowing the lawn. First time. You know what I did? I made a mess out of it, just like you did. I rode my bike all the way down to the store, pulled into the store, you know what I did? I spent every penny on candy, thank you very much. Maybe a couple arcade games, because those are fun too. But my point is, is like, when we're given freedom, we make a mess out of it, don't we? When we're given authority, oftentimes we do. But here's the thing, we've got to settle this and Joseph settled this because he's not looking for anybody else to dictate his future because he understood this and we've got to wrestle with this, that power, promotion, all come from God and all belong to him. We might think we do it. We might delude ourselves into thinking that we've done it, but let's, go, let's be honest. Have you really done anything not meaningful on your own in this life? I mean, men, have you really done anything significant in your life without your wife? Come on. I can't say anything to the women. I'm not a wife, so I can't say any of that, but I can talk to the husbands. I'm joking, but the truth is, is you know that God has put her in your journey to make you a better person. And you, vice versa. And here's the journey, is that we know these things. We know this, that without us having guardrails in this journey, we will find our way astray. We always have, just human nature. 
Listen, we can delude ourselves into thinking, I'm so disciplined and I'm, and you might be more disciplined than the next person, but you're never disciplined enough for this life. This life will eat you alive. I don't care how strong you are inside, how difficult, you gotta have grit. Don't get me wrong, you need to have grit. But if you think you can rely on grit alone, you will be sad and you will be hurt and you will be alone. Because grit, listen, tenacity is important. You know what's more important? Humility. Kindness, gentleness, graciousness, self-control. The things that Jesus said, if you trust me, if you trust me, be gritty, and then on the other side of those things, I will help you be kind and gentle and tenacious. But you do it out of a drive and a desire to submit and to serve your king, not yourself. So what happens here? Joseph, back to Joseph. Joseph's journey is an interesting one because this kind of picture we see of God having all authority and control, this even, we even see this in Jesus, right? Jesus in John chapter 19, remember this part? Jesus is getting ready to be crucified. He goes before Pilate and Pilate says, you won't speak to me, huh? Do you know who I am? And Jesus kind of like, hmm, do you know who I am? No, he doesn't say that. <laughs> That'd be really great. Yeah, just, there's, a, there's a meme for you if you make memes, there you go. No, you know what he says? Do you know who I am? I'm a man with much authority. And Jesus looks at him and he's like, the only authority you have is the one that God has given you. And this isn't like a, ooh, gotcha moment. No, this is just Jesus speaking truth. He's just saying all of it comes from heaven. That the real world that we live in is a reflection of the creation that God intended, but it is a far cry from what he desired. And I'm constantly, and this is what Jesus do. I'm constantly in the business of trying to redeem all of it was broken so that it would reflect the kingdom that I desired at creation. Well, what do we do? We're like, oh, look what I did. And Jesus is like, come on. You know, I read the disciples. If you've been around here a lot, I talk about this sometimes. But like, you read, you read the parables and the disciples are like, mm. yeah. And you know, Jesus is never, I don't think Jesus is an eye roller. But if I was Jesus, I'd be an eye roller. You're just kind of like, <laughs> you're like, poor Jesus, like, how many years? I only got three. How, I spent the first two and a half just kind of like, come on. It's never enough. But you know what? This is beautiful. Here's why. Because it is God's promise to be with you even when you're hard-headed. Even when you're hard-hearted and you're saying, I will always be with you. Will you let me into your journey? So here's what happens here. And this is what's interesting about Joseph's deal because a lot of times, you know what Joseph doesn't do? He started out as an immature kid with a vision that God gave him, and then he turns into this humble servant later. You know what he figured out? He figured out that he was never gonna arrive anywhere in his journey. He was gonna have to trust God to take him there. So I don't know about you, but what I watch in a lot of times in culture is we end up in this place where we think someday we're just gonna like, poof, like we're just gonna arrive at the thing we were called and created to do and the individual thing that only I can do and the whole world will praise me. Like we all think we're gonna be Michael Jordan or something one day. Uh, when you talk about this, I'm using him as an example. And no, it's not up for debate whether he's the most important or best basketball player of all time. He just is. It's just period. I know all the young people are like, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, who else has sold bazillions of shoes and you're wearing them still? Anyway, my point is this. is like, listen, we all think that one day we're like, we're just gonna kind of, some illusion, we're just gonna find our thing. And then we're all of a sudden one day we're just gonna show up and be perfect. And then we think that the journey has nothing to do with the process of development that God wants to do in us. Listen, we buried my grandpa on Wednesday. Now, we actually didn't bury him. He got cremated, I should say. We did his memorial service on Wednesday. And I was a blubbery mess. I shared for like five minutes, like just all over myself. Here's why. Because he was one of the best men I ever knew. And I was so grateful that when he died a month ago, I wrote some things down because I wouldn't have thought about him on Wednesday. And one of the things I shared was that my grandfather was one of those just like spectacularly unspectacular people. And let me explain because that sounds offensive, but it's actually really my way to honor him because you know what he didn't do? He didn't care about people's praise. He didn't go seeking honor from other people. He just served humbly and he was concerned about just living well with the gifts and the, and the, and the place that God had placed him. Just that's it. He wasn't loud or boisterous, um, you know, until you got to know him. And then he, he was kind of funny. He thought he was more funny than he actually was, but it's okay. 
He was pretty funny. Um, he told all of my girlfriends and my wife, every girlfriend I, he, I ever had that he met and my wife that they were lucky they got to meet him. That was what they told him. <laughs> but he's like the most unassuming guy. So when he says it, you're like, wait, what? <laughs> and then they realize he's got a lot of jokes and he's funny. But you know, the thing he always did is he always understood where God had placed him, how God had gifted him. And he leveraged those gifts for other people. Now, if you've been at Water of Life for very long, we used to, before we peeled the top and drank the cup and the wafer out of the little... Thing? Yeah. Yeah, before that, we did real communion with like cups and grape juice and like the whole bit, and we passed a tray. What you don't know is my grandfather made the first trays that we ever used for that, and they were copied over and over and over again because he was a carpenter. So you never, you never saw my grandpa up here. You never saw him like, you know, leading a rally or running for office or doing anything that would, in the world's eyes, be seen as significant. But you know what he did? He loved everybody around him well. Sometimes without words, often without words, he would just serve and give his life away in the places that he knew that he was called and when he could, he would give. And he would just do it. Not because he had to, but because God had done something inside of him and he was faithful to death. And this is why I say he was spectacularly unspectacular because he lived a quiet life like Paul tells Timothy. Live a quiet life, a life that is dedicated to God. And listen, this is what Joseph's doing. Joseph's not trying to promote himself. He found a way to live well in the presence of a forgotten dream. Or that, let me say this, that he felt like God had forgotten. Or maybe he's like, man, I was a crazy kid. I had this dream one time. I was crazy. But you know, later in this story, and and you'll see this in verse five and verse six, these two guys that end up in jail with Joseph both have dreams. And they come to Joseph and say, we had these dreams, both of us last night, we had these dreams and there are two dreams, right? And the thing that Joseph is like watching their faces, asking them what's wrong with them. He was looking for them, he was observing them. And there's a couple of lessons here for us. In the middle of our injustice and our confusion, are we willing to look up and out and still care for other people even though we don't know what God is doing with us in that moment? This is really the mark of servant leadership that in the middle of us trying to figure out why we're where we are, we're still committed to serving other people. Most of us, the answer is no. Why? Because we haven't figured out that we're not the most important person in the world. We're not. That group I was telling you about earlier, um, my small group guys, we have a saying, Anytime we're like complaining about work or this or that, or I work at the most perfect place in the world, so I never complain about my job, ever. <laughs> we have this saying, you know what our saying is? You're not that important. Because we have a propensity to remind ourselves that, or tell ourselves, or lie to ourselves that our feelings and what we are experiencing are more important than everything else around us. And then we lose focus of what it actually means to serve other people. The thing that Jesus modeled for us, the he, thing he called us to do. See, their sad faces, these guys, they were an opportunity for Joseph to lean into their story. Their story isn't great, I'll be honest. One of them has a great outcome and the other one doesn't have a great outcome. But see God move in the middle of it and it's a picture of the Old Testament and the New Testament as well, excuse me, the New Testament and the Old Testament because Joseph lived with two assumptions and these aren't your notes and you might wanna write them down. Joseph lived with two assumptions that changed the trajectory of his journey, and they were this. One, that God would always be at work even when he couldn't see it. That God always was at work. He lived with the assumption, I don't get it, God, but you're still at work. That's called hope. That's called a promise. That God will be with you. That you're at work even when I can't see it. And the second thing is this, that he was responsible to be faithful with the gifts he was given no matter where he was placed. Even if it's not fair, even if it's unjust, even if you don't like him or her, I was talking about your spouse. Look at, be faithful. God is with you and God is at work. Probably in you more than them. At least that's true in my story. In verses nine through 13, the first dream comes and it's the baker and he has this dream and then it's really not good for him. And then Joseph interprets the dreams for them 
And uh, in verse 16 through 22, you get the second dream. And that dream's a little bit better for the cupbearer. But there's a picture here of the New Testament, the Old Testament here, because there's one person saved and one person lost. A little bit looks like, this looks a little bit like Calvary, right? Like on the cross. And really, if you remember that story in Luke, where Luke talks about it, verse 20, or chapter 23, Jesus hang on the cross next to two what? Criminals. And those two criminals have a very interesting exchange, according to Luke, on the cross, or hanging there where they're talking, slowly dying. They, one of them looks and mocks Jesus. So you're the Messiah, prove it by saving yourself. He's like mocking Jesus. And the other one looks over and is like, even on death's doorstep, you aren't offended or scared by God. It's like, what is your deal, man? And he says this, and this is out of Luke, and this starts in verse 40. Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom? Would you just do what you promised to do in all of Torah, Jesus, that you, if you're the Messiah, that you're gonna have a kingdom, would you just think of me? And Jesus said to him, today I promise you, you'll be in paradise with me. Not because of anything he could do, but only what Jesus could do for him. The invitation for that moment, listen, the moment of suffering, and listen, this guy is living out the justice that was the response to his injustice. And yet Jesus is still faithful in that moment. How much more faithful is Jesus gonna be to those who are in the middle of injustice? Listen, he is gracious and kind and long-suffering, even to this guy. But the same story is the outcome, very similar. It's not an accident, it's a prophetic picture. And here's what you see in verse 40 and 15, Genesis chapter 40, verse 15. This is what the dream means. Joseph said, the three branches you represent, oh, by the way, this is the second one. He's interpreted the second one. The first one, he looks at the guys, bad news. You're gonna get promoted back into your job and within three days, your head's gonna be on a spike. Meaning, you're gonna make Pharaoh angry. Again, he's not gonna send you to prison. And they're gonna parade you around as a sign of don't make Pharaoh angry. So uh, next time you wanna move into prophetic, just be prepared. You have to tell somebody, no, I'm just kidding, you don't have to do that. But the second one, these three branches, this is, what, this is Joseph interpreting the cupbearer's dream, represent three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift you up and restore you to position as a chief cupbearer. And please remember me. And do me a favor when things go well for you. Mention me to Pharaoh so he might let me out of this place for I was kidnapped from my homeland, the land of the Hebrews, and now I'm here in prison, but I didn't do anything to deserve it, which is what everybody in prison says, right? He just says, hey, remember me. Get me out of here. He's humble, but he's human. And he takes advantage of an opportunity God's put in front of him. But he's trying to be faithful. He's serving this guy. You get this? In the moment where he should be capitalizing on this moment, he's serving him by helping him and looking for an opportunity to serve him. And he's being faithful to God by using the God, gifts God has given him. Even, listen, even when all injustice is happening. See, I don't think Joseph struggled with the question of evil like we do. So I don't think Joseph walks around going, well, you know, if, if bad things happen to me, God must not be alive. Nowhere in his story does he say, well, man, I should just kind of throw out this whole thing and just try a different way. No, 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 you know what he does? And this is so interesting. He doesn't see a problem of evil in God, not because he's not smart, but because he settled the question because he understood evil as being the thing that was invited into the world by people. And so why would we be surprised when evil exists? What Joseph understands is his responsibility is to be faithful and change evil to good in the places that he could. Listen, that's the call of a follower of Jesus is you take what is evil and destructive and give it life and hope, not because of anything you can do or I can do, but because of what he can do with you, through you. This is why we tell you all the time, go serve, give your life away, go to the streets, go to city link, go around the world, go give your life away because you have something to give to somebody else that could change the trajectory of their life and God gave it to you, you didn't give it to yourself. So... Let's go home. No, I'm just kidding. We're not done yet. Look, this is the last part. Proverbs. 
Proverbs gives us a picture here, and this is important because a lot of you are in a place where, where, where your hope has been deferred. Where that, that thing, it's been kicked down the street, been kicked down the, 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 the tracks. You just think, I'm, it's never gonna happen. And what does Proverbs say about that? That, that deferred dreams make a heart, what, sick. And listen, everything in Joseph should have been discouraged and sick. But somehow he picks himself up, leverages himself going, God is with me. I'm going to be faithful even when I don't understand what's going on. There are times that God gives dreams and there's times that he takes them away and tests us. Again, Joseph is doing the right thing over and over and over again. And yet he's forgotten for two more full years. Look at this in Genesis 41.1. Now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream and the cupbearer remembered Joseph left in prison. I can imagine that moment they clean Joseph up and they bring him up and it's like, hey, that's the guy that told me my dream. Pharaoh, he can tell you. If I was Joseph, I would look at him like, thanks, bro. <laughs> two years. How's it going? You having fun drinking your wine? Woo! But no, you know what Joseph says? Like, I, I can't. Pharaoh, I can't interpret your dream, but my God can. Over and over in his journey, there's something so powerful. Joseph is doing powerful things and never takes credit for him because he understands where power and authority all come from. This is why in the middle of his discouragement, he can stay hold fast. This is why when the injustice happens, he's got some grit in his soul because he understands this, that God is in this. And power belongs to him and my life belongs to him. So he will have to have his way with me. I also think this. I think he never forgot that dream that God was gonna do something significant with his life. We talked about this last week and I hope that for you in the next few minutes or what will happen for you is the same thing that happened with him, that you will make a decision somewhere deep inside of here that God has a plan to do something significant with your life, whether anybody ever knows about it, but that is the thing that you hold on to for the rest of your life. When the time comes, you don't understand it. When the diagnosis comes, you don't understand it. When the divorce comes, you don't understand it. When the kids rebel or you get sick or you lose somebody or listen, or unrest happens or and justice happens or racism happens in your sphere, you hold on to that promise that he said, I will be with you, but remember that thing I gave you. It's the thing you lean towards, not hope and people. You hope in the presence of God and you leverage your life to change the world around you for the betterment of the people around you. See, this never goes away. This is where we get ourselves lost. We think, I don't need other people. It's, no, no, listen. You need other people and other people need you. And it was like, yay, until you get in the parking lot, you gotta fight with the guy, get out, okay? Look. <laughs> or you're gonna go to In-N-Out and fight in line for one car, one spot. You're like, who cares? You're all wrapped around the parking lot anyway. <laughs> Look it. Your life's meaning will be defined by how well you love Jesus and how well you love other people. And if you don't hear anything else today, remember this, and this is the thing I wanna leave with you because this is so important, that discouragement and disillusionment will want to be deterrents in your life. But they do not have to be deterrents. They can be an invitation to grow, to heal, to change, and to leverage your life for something bigger than you. But that requires the two things that Joseph figured out, that you gotta get humble, and the only way you get humble is that you surrender back towards your king and take whatever he puts your way, believing that he is in it with you and that he will help you walk through it. So, see, disillusionment comes from living in an illusion that we think that we deserve something or that God has created something that we don't. And I'll leave you with this. Some of you, your pain is the byproduct of substituting people for God. Here's what I mean. Some of us have substituted people and placed our hope in people and not God. And be like, well, that person told me you're gonna be with me. You just made them God in your world. So then when they fail you, your hope is all gone. And some of you have a problem because you placed people in that place, relied on people and put your hope in people, not in and your savior, and when they disappoint you, you're then hurt by people. 
which is normal and human. But the problem is that you put your hope in them. So when they fail you, which they're inevitably going to do, your hope is gone. And so people are the problem because you place them in a place they never belong or deserve to be. And then you gave them the ability to hurt you in ways they never should. Because you put them at the top, not your king. And when we substitute people for God, it's a bad process. It's the Garden of Eden when we choose our own desire over the desire of our king. Who wants to give us hope and life, but somehow in our brokenness we choose death. But he wants to redeem those moments. Not let it change your trajectory, but give you hope and give you life. So we all have two choices. C.S. Lewis said it best when he said this, that God whispers in our pleasure, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. Because watch, we have two choices, to get better and lose faith and become disillusioned, or we can allow the pain to lead us to humility and submission and ultimately learn to trust God. But trusting God never comes without pain and submission and humility. If we are averse to pain and we are allergic to humility, we will never experience submission. We will never experience trust in God. We can't. That's why I tell you that disillusionment and discouragement appear like deterrence, but they are actually invitations to grow, to heal, and to let God restore you. Would you stay with me right now? In just a second, if you're at Upland or at Townsville, your pastor's gonna come close with you, but I wanna read you one thing. This is a, a prophetic word from the prophet Jeremiah who is giving a word to the people of Israel about a future hope and promise, not a current one. They're in the middle of making some really bad decisions, but he gives them this word. He says, cursed are those who put their trust in people who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from God. They're like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in barren wilderness in an uninhabited, salty place. But blessed are those who trust God and have made the Lord their God their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves are green and they never stop producing fruit. What we all know is that bitterness, unforgiveness, even in the face of injustice, will never produce a heart that trusts God. We all know that to be true. It's a heart that's giving in to discouragement and disillusionment. A lot of us, the question is why? Why here, why now, why me? Why this injustice, why this pain, why this suffering, why this thing? That's, that's the question. But really the question isn't really or shouldn't really be why, but who? And the who is, who is allowing this? God, why are you letting this happen and where are you in it? And the psalmist says this in Psalm 62, verse five, my soul will wait in silence for God and God alone for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation and my stronghold. I will not be shaken. On God, my salvation and my glory rest. The rock of my strength, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times. O oh, people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge. So. And now at Upland and Townsville, Pastor Matt and Pastor John are gonna come close your service. But here in Fontana, I want to just ask you one thing. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a second? Because I want to pray something over you. Some of you have never chosen to follow Jesus. And that is a, a trajectory all on its own. But the invitation that you need to do that is just simply this. When you look at the journey of your life, you will see that God has always been with you. Will you choose to acknowledge him? That is simply all it is. And then if you acknowledge him, he will put you on a path to be able to follow Jesus, who was just simply God walking among us. And as you do that, you begin to see the path that he had laid long ago to do something great in your journey and wants to heal, restore, 
and redeem you, but don't let discouragement and disillusion deter you from chasing after him because that is a lie from hell that wants to see the destruction have its way in you. For the rest of you, you're gonna hit bumps and maybe you're in a bump right now. You're gonna be tempted to be discouraged and you're gonna be tempted to be disillusioned. The real question is just two things. One, do you have people around you that will keep you on track? Because you're not gonna figure this out on your own. And then the second thing is just this. Have you committed yourself to the truth that God is with you? Even when you forget it, and that these moments that are difficult could be an invitation because we never arrive anywhere in this life without a journey. And the legacy you leave in this life will be marked out by the journey that you take that will be full of bumps, but will also be full of his presence if you allow him. So Jesus, I pray that over us this day, that we would allow you to have your way over us, in us, with us, and through us, that we might represent you the way you want us to and chase the dreams, chase the callings, that we might leave a legacy through the destinies you've put in front of us just the way you designed it. Would you redeem the broken hurt, desolate places in us, and do your greatest work, which is loving people. We will love you and we thank you for those things. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And everyone said, amen. If you need prayer this weekend, our ministers team will be up here. We'd love to pray with you. God bless you guys. Have a great week.